on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I don't regard myself as a hunter. I regard myself as a deer manager, and it really is a difference. I'm seeing you with two dogs. I'm assuming, you know, you've got your camera person, you've got other talent with you, and you guys are just stalking up into, you know, 40 yards up on these big old bucks that I just can't picture it ever working here. In the UK, unlike the US, we are allowed to shoot deer in the wild and put them into the public food chain. The food component is the big push that's building public trust for hunters right now. And we're having like a bit of a renaissance right now. The food piece is key. There's an awareness now in this country that deer have to be managed. I can go out and harvest a deer any day of the week, 365 days a year. I watched you field dress a deer with a level of deafness and efficiency that I'd never seen, literally never seen. If you've got to cull 200 deer, you'll do 50 a day. I am a wild farmer, that is what I do. Episode 119 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Farming the Wild with Mike Robinson, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival carries a premium line of nutritional supplements, all designed to help you thrive through the unique health challenges presented by our modern world. Products like colostrum to super boost your immunity, pine pollen to boost testosterone levels naturally, and vitamin D3 to supercharge your immune system. Right now until February 15th, get an additional 15% off Sir Thrival's Valentine's Day specials. Products like Taboo, Sir Thrival's premium libido boosting formula made with velvet antler tribulus and rich dark chocolate, or beautifying Shizandra berry powder grown right here in the USA. Even Sir Thrival's flagship elk velvet antler products are on sale now. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire lineup. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you can thrive? This episode is also brought to you by Wild Food Warehouse. Wild Food Warehouse is your preferred source for hand-foraged wild rice. They also carry a beautiful line of hand-harvested berry and plant powders from the northern latitudes of Finland. Their blueberry, lingonberry, and spruce dip powders are all sourced from pristine lands north of the Arctic Circle and packed in light-resistant, nutrient-protecting, violet-colored mirror glass. And they've just added a new 150-gram size that's three times more product at a significant savings. I love mixing a tablespoon of these powders into a liter of water water, squeezing in some lemon and adding a little stevia to sweeten it. It makes a super refreshing and hydrating drink and the rich color and flavor of these powders lets you know you're getting mega dosed with antioxidants and key nutrients like vitamin C. Head over to wildfoodwarehouse.com to check out their selection of Arctic sourced fruit and superfood powders, and of course for hand harvested wild rice too. The coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your order. Again, it's Wild Food Warehouse and the coupon code is WILDFED. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. I've got a fascinating interview for you today, one that's taken three attempts to get recorded. That's because our guest, Mike Robinson, is in London, and we've just been buggered, as they say, trying to keep the transatlantic internet connection going. But we finally did it, and I'm so glad. Mike's a restaurateur in the UK, specializing in bringing wild game meat to the market and table, something we can't really do here in the US, but is legal in England. More specifically, he and his restaurants specialize in wild venison. In fact, Mike's playing a significant role in how wild venison reaches British diners. But he's also a television personality who currently has four different shows airing on Outdoor Channel. That's right, four different shows. One of which, Farming the Wild, which airs in the same block as Wild Fed, often features him hunting deer in ways that, frankly, I've just never seen. Stalking through the English countryside with dogs, head shooting deer off shooting sticks, and letting his dogs find the deer. Then he field dresses those deer to enter the restaurant market. If you've never seen a man in a tweed golf hat field dress a deer in 70 seconds, you need to see his show. Mike has a method of cleaning deer that's faster, more hygienic, and more efficient than anything I've ever seen. It comes from having harvested thousands, yes, the thousands of deer, and he'll describe his method for us in this interview. There's a lot of really useful takeaways in this conversation, things that'll make your field care and final cooking product even better. It's also a very intriguing contrast, the difference between British and American hunting culture. 
Here, with our vast public lands, huge wilderness areas, and relatively short history as a domesticated landscape, our hunting culture has been shaped by a rugged, survivalist aesthetic. There in the UK, where there's been thousands of years of domestication and farming, their hunting culture is more akin to animal husbandry, which is why Mike's show is called Farming the Wild. And while the differences are fascinating between the old world and the new, I'm even more interested in what we can learn from each other. Mike Robinson, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Third time's a charm. We've tried this a couple times. You're over in the UK. I'm here in Maine. So uh, we're a world apart, I'd say. Oh, only 3,000 miles. You know? <laughs> not too not too shabby. <laughs> uh, end of your day, beginning of mine, I think. So uh, how have you been? How's your day been? Uh, it's been good. I've been at my restaurant in London today. Um, and uh, just, um, you know... It's unfortunately the restaurant business is is uh, when you own them just tends to be less creative and more about solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, putting a lot of fires out. And and at the moment there's a lot of fires to put out. You know, tell so, give us give <clears throat> us a little give us a little backstory, man. You've got you're in the restaurant business. You know, yep. I know you from your work on Outdoor Channel, your show um, Farming the Wild. So it sounds like you've got a lot a lot of you know um, irons in the fire, as they say. But tell yes, us a little I, bit about your story. So. Um, well, where, do we, where to start? I, um, I've always, I suppose, been an entrepreneur, but I've also always been very passionate about the outdoors. And particularly when I opened my first restaurant in a little country pub back in 2005, um, I, I wanted to do something different. And I made a commitment that I would use predominantly wild food as, as ingredients. Now, you must understand that in the UK, unlike the US, we are allowed to shoot deer in the wild and, and pheasants and partridges and ducks and rabbits and put them into the public food chain. So we can do that. So um, there, there is, of course, a process that has to be followed. But, you know, so I've made my career from using very, probably before anyone used the word sustainable, we were using sustainable ingredients. Okay. What year are you talking about there? 2005. Okay. Yeah. It was a bit of, it was a bit bleak in the food world back then. Yeah, it was. And, you know, we were, I, I determined to start using wild venison as a core meat. And, uh, and in the sort of, in the 18 years since then, um, you know, I've seen deer populations in Britain go through the roof. Uh, but on the other hand, venison also become much more popular. You know, um, the bird hunting, which is much bigger than deer hunting in Britain as a sport, uh, is is sort of uh, having a lot of problems with its public image. However, deer, there's an awareness now in this country that deer have to be managed because the numbers are going berserk. And this pandemic has really exacerbated that. They, you know, we, we, we think that due to the way we do things, we might have seen an increase in a single year in the UK of 30% in deer numbers. Over wow. The Wow, how does the how has the pandemic impacted that? I'm I'm not well. Clear. If you think so, so, so if you put it into perspective of what you guys do, imagine if uh, all the land in the states was private. Okay, all of it. There was no public land, no public hunting. Okay, there were a very small amount of people. You had tight firearms laws, and there were a very small amount of people per capita who had rifles for hunting deer. We're not allowed to do bow hunting. We're not allowed to do um, wow. muzzle loaders. We, it's only a rifle for deer, okay, in Britain. And uh, and it's – but uh, so what's happened is – we have game dealers. You'd call them processors. And game dealers are guys, are middlemen. They buy. I'm. I, I. Let's say I have permission to kill the deer on a, on a thousand acre piece of land, and I've got to kill fifty deer a year on that land. Okay. So I will shoot those deer, and I will sell them to a game dealer. I have to be licensed, which means I have to have done various courses that that say that I'm particularly on food hygiene. That then I have to put a tag on that deer, which merely is a, a statement tag. It says. I've examined this deer. Here's a num it's, a, it's got a number, and it says the deer was healthy when I observed it. I've inspected its guts, and I'm happy it can go in the food chain. That then goes to a game dealer. He buys it off me, or she buys it off me, and for an in fur price, you know, heads off, legs off, guts out in the fur, uh, whatever it might be, a couple of bucks a kilo, you know, something like that. And uh, and then he skins it, gets it inspected by a government veterinarian. And then it goes into the public food chain. That's how it works. Um, wow. 
Now, so different. So different. So, di- so different. But what it means is when it regards to actually managing deer, and I don't regard myself as a hunter. I regard myself as a deer manager, and it really is a difference. Um, I I I don't really hunt recreationally. I I manage very large populations of wild deer, and you know at the moment I manage my little organisation manages about. 40,000 acres of land wow. and next year that's probably going up to about 60 My and goodness. on that but just give you an idea of how fertile we are and how many deer there are of different species as well on my land there are three different species four actually um you know on on 60,000 acres of land we'll probably have to shoot 2000 deer wow um, <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness yeah yeah so Whoa. this year on our 40,000 acres we've we've harvested um we will have harvested by the end of the season about 1200 so Whew. yeah i know it's quite a lot <laughs> what are the species of deer that you have there predominantly fallow deer um in the wild brought to us by the romans so a bit like Monty Python said, what did the Romans ever do for us? Well, you know, in our case, it's fallow deer. And believe they're amazing, they were amazing people. They brought fallow deer all the way from Syria to Britain 2,000 years ago. Wow. And, and then they had enclosures and then they've escaped. And then there was another introduction of fallow deer by the Normans when William the Conqueror turned up 1,000 years ago. And then... It became heavily fashionable in the 1700s to have a deer park outside your stately home, your massive mansion, you know, okay. 10,000 yeah. acres, which the whole <laughs> country was divided into. They all had deer parks and the deer parks had predominantly fallow and red deer in them. And so they were usually walled, enclosed. Um, to give you an idea, the biggest deer park, just about one of the biggest deer parks is down in, um, in the south coast of England. Uh, and in Sussex called Petworth Park. And it's my friend manages it. It's amazing. And that deer park was created by King Henry VIII in the year 1500s. Wow. And the same herd of deer have been in there without any changes for that long. And they're amazing. They're the, some of the biggest in the country. Genetically, nothing weird going on from being no, isolated? No, they're, they're, or have there been population phenomenal. introductions? Really? Nope. No, no, they're amazing. Wow. They obviously, when they did it, brought in enough different gene pools that they, right. you know, so, but it's extraordinary, the history of deer in Britain. And so, um, and it's a huge subject, but basically, um, you know, take Petworth, for example, that, that didn't have a fence around it. It had a nine foot high stone wall that was a 14 miles long or something. <laughs> and it was constructed by prisoners of war taken in the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's fascinating. So deer are very important to our psyche. And I'm, I'm generally talking to you about England. Scotland, by the way, which everyone re- associates with deer and Britain, is managed completely differently. And, oh, okay. and, and so I'll focus on England because that's what we do. And um, but your your listeners will not would not believe how many deer there are in England and how extraordinary the, the deer hunting is in this country. I mean, it, it, the byproduct of the management is phenomenal quality deer stalking. Like, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm out for the next two days and all I have to do to go hunting is just to send a message to the, the landowner saying, I'm out tomorrow. That's it. Yeah. You know, and- I, watching your show, I've, I, I'm, I'm seeing you with two dogs. I'm yeah. assuming, you know, you've got your camera person. I've yeah, got yeah. other talent with you and you guys are just stalking up into, you know, 40 yeah. yards up on these big old bucks that yeah, yeah. I just can't picture it ever working here. You know, so watching yeah. it, you're, I'm going, <laughs> OK, I'm seeing a, this is a cultural phenomenon that's different because, you know, I don't know if yeah. you've heard this, Mike, but here in the States, we tend to think the whole world revolves around us. You probably didn't know that. And so it's funny, you know, as an American to see stuff going on outside of here and being like, oh, OK, I've got a very limited worldview of what hunting looks like. But can, can I go back a, a moment yeah, to you said um, that COVID had had this impact and I don't think we really finished that thought. Yeah, so it, uh, very easy and very concise to t- tell you about it. Essentially, we reckon that prior to COVID, if I go back 20 years, OK, and it, we had foot and mouth disease. Um uh, we had foot and mouth disease uh, in the UK. And basically, the whole of the rural part of Britain by government diktat was closed for a year, right? A whole year. It's about 2001. And 
it, quite literally, no one was allowed to do anything. The farmers, you know, all their cattle were killed and burnt. There were these horrific images of huge smokestacks of the, the army killing and burning herds of cows. It was awful, you know, right. and um, caused huge problems. But the downside was no deer got shot at all for a year. None. Zip. Wow. <laughs> um, that that gave the deer population of Britain a massive single year jump, you know, like you imagine in the US if no white tails were cold for a whole year. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. And that happened here. So the problem in Britain is there's 40 odd thousand people who have a license to shoot deer with a rifle in the whole country oh my goodness. out of 68 million. Because getting a rifle is not easy here. There's a catch-22 you have to go through. You have to have a place to shoot with it and experience, right? <laughs> and you, but you can't have a rifle until you've already got that experience and a place to do it. Uh -huh. so, so it's not easy. And it does mean, though, that, you know, there are some elements to it. You know, we have no, no one has pistols. Lots of people have shotguns but because bird shooting is huge. And you're allowed to have a shotgun as long as you're not a naughty boy you know, in this country, <laughs> sure. um, you still have to apply for it and get referees and things like that. Can you but have a, but can you have slugs in addition to buckshot or, or are you restricted? No, to shot no, only? no, no. It's birds only. Oh, bird you, shot I, only. So you yeah, couldn't you have buckshot or something. Like you're that. You're not allowed to shoot a deer with a shotgun in Britain. Okay. So, but like, even like, like here in the States, we're so steeped in this idea of like home defense. <laughs> so no, no, we don't have any home defense. Right. Um, okay. Gotcha. I've got, got I've got a shot. Jack Russell. That's the home defense. <laughs> well, they're pretty gnarly. And, um, no, no, nobody has home defense in Britain because nobody's got any guns. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And, 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 you know, your common or garden, the problem is, the thing is, the rules here, the police rules here are so strict. If you're caught with a, an unlicensed firearm, okay, you are in jail for five years and there is no, there is zero, you, can, you can't get a lawyer to get you out. It's just straight to jail five years, right? Wow. No remission. Okay. And so, you know, the criminals very rarely have guns here because particularly in the rural areas, because they know. So they, they, we've got the usual problems of people stealing ATVs and breaking in your house and stuff, but they don't carry guns. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, we don't do home defense, really. Got and it. I've got consequences well. are too high. <laughs> yeah, and I've got tanks as well. <laughs> so, um, I'll run over their car, you know. So, so, um, so, so it's a cultural difference. We, um, so... The good thing, though, is, is and all the land in Britain is private. This is the point I was getting to. All the land in the UK is private. OK, so there is almost no there's certainly no um, public land hunting in this country at all. So you have to persuade a landowner to give you consent to harvest deer on their land. And so what I do is I go I talk to landowners. It's a long process. And I say. You have a deer problem. Uh, we will help you with it we're, and, and we'll put in what I do is I put in a program. We do thermal surveys. We create a, we do a proper plan for them on how to manage the deer on their land. And you do, we, you said you do thermal uh, assays. Surveys. That's, that's a, yeah. okay. So that's allowing you to get a better head count because you're seeing yeah, deer yeah. at night and all of that. Yeah. We go out it's usually about 10 PM for two hours in like just after the harvest uh, in like September and we we count deer, you know, okay. and we then we get. But with fallow deer, it's a waste of time, really, because they go twenty miles in a day, so they're off your land, you know. Oh, okay. So and they go where they're not being shot as well. They're very smart. So um, anyway, so so what happened with, in Britain was uh, the game dealers, the processors, their pro their prices crashed. They stopped paying any money for deer, and often they just closed down and said no deer because on the seventh of March last year. Uh, in, sorry, in 2020, the government closed all our restaurants down overnight in all of them in the country because yeah. of COVID. And they did. And that was supposed to be for four weeks and it lasted five months. And and so that the March is the key month for killing deer, really. It's the last month of the female season. And as we as as all people who are conservation minded hunters know, you only manage a population by harvesting does. You know, mm -hmm. you, yep. when you're trying to control numbers, you can't do it by shooting things with antlers. It doesn't work. So, <laughs> you know, that you have to take them, but they don't breed you know, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at herds of 200 fallow deer and 180 of them are female, you know, you've really got to do some female work. So, so um, we, we, we have to work on these. We've got very long deer seasons. The fallow deer season comes into the 1st of August and runs right through to the 1st of April. 
Um, wow. And roe deer is 12 months of the year, six month toes, six month bucks. Wow. Munjack are all year round because they're tropical and they breed all year round. You know, so I, I can go out and harvest a deer any, any day of the week, 365 days a year. Wow. Um, and you can just, in the market, as far as restaurants are concerned, chefs got a, a pretty unlimited supply of venison to work yeah, with. Yeah. And chefs love it. And chefs are starting to embrace it. I'm actually next week launching a national program on persuading chefs to use more wild venison. Oh, cool. Called right the Wild on. Venison Project. So, oh, wow. Um, and I have my own deer processing business called Deer Box. And we're cutting about 80 fallow deer a week at the moment. And oh we sell goodness. them to chefs and to the public all over the country. And that doesn't really dip through the year because you, you have this consistent supply. Well, it dips for three months in the summer when the fallow okay. are gone. But but we build, what we do is we build up a stockpile in our freezers and then we can keep selling it all summer okay. um, as barbecue meat, you know. So so when the pandemic hit, we lost the foot, we lost the month of March. Okay. And and they hadn't shot much in leading up to March because the prices were so low. Because they're always thinking, all the guys who are harvesting deer are thinking, well, I'll wait until the price goes up, then I'll go and shoot the deer. And then the season runs out. And then uh, we got to, um, then it reopened and we thought, great. So September and October, we shot some male fallow deer, shot some roe deer, you know, munjack, a few. And then in November, they closed us all down again, right through till March. <laughs> okay. And so the, and then at the same time, Brexit happened. And then we couldn't export to venison to the Europe anymore. Okay. So, so there was a perfect storm here, double whammy. And so literally the game, all the game processors and us think that the cull was down over 18 months. So one and a half breeding cycles, the cull was down 50 to 60% in Britain. Wow. So imagine that in American terms, you imagine what would happen to your mm -hmm. whitetail population. Mm -hmm. So we're now seeing the backside of that this season. It's open, but We've got the ironic situation of finding it hard to buy deer off hunters because they've kind of lost the impetus to go out and harvest deer. They, and the, the market, the bottom of the market dropped out as well. I imagine with all the restaurants closed. So suddenly you've got no financial incentive for the hunt. Uh, that is exactly what happened. The financial, the, the, the value of deer plummeted to nothing. And so the game dealers were saying to the hunters, don't go out. Okay. There's, we can't take your deer. And look, fallow deer are like whitetail. They're not small. If if you're going out, like uh, some, we'll go out sometimes and shoot six or eight in a day. What are you going to do with those? You can't just give them to people. I mean, they, <laughs> right. you know, there's so um, there's a huge amount of processing involved, and most people don't have the facilities. We do. Most people don't. So um, a lot of entrepreneurialism happened. A lot of people started doing it at home in their garage, selling it to friends. You know. Legally, or this is sort of under the table? Legally. Yeah, okay. There is an exemption for killing small numbers of deer in Britain that allows you to sell them. Wow. As long as you your premises has been inspected by your local authority. Okay. So there's some degree of oversight. It's not as good as what we have, which is government veterinarians stamping it like USDA, you know? Yeah. Um, but it, it is a good thing because it keeps the deer numbers killing, keeps people killing. Um, What's and been it, the imp it, it, what's been the cool. impact for the for the landowners who, who many of whom I assume are involved in agriculture? Has this spike in deer numbers been catastrophic at the depredation level? We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, if you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can now stream all ten episodes on demand at myoutdoortv.com. Myoutdoortv.com is Outdoor Channel's premium online subscription service. They host thousands of episodes of hunting and fishing content, making this a great subscription service for anyone interested in the outdoors. But if you just want to see Wild Fed, grab yourself a free trial subscription and then check out all 10 episodes at no charge. If you decide to keep it, it's just $9.99 a month. We're currently in post-production for Season 2 of Wild Fed, which is shaping up to be an awesome season of new episodes. They'll start premiering on Outdoor Channel in the next month or so. Thanks again for your incredible support. Now, back to the show. Well, we're just seeing it now, don't forget, because it's only just starting to kick in now because the fawns yeah. are just growing up now. Okay. And uh, they won't, they're really going to see it. I hate to say it. They're really going to see it in the harvest this year. Yeah. Okay. When they're harvesting and their crops are just, you know. Yeah. So, but the biggest problem in Britain is we've got a massive government drive to reforest Britain, to do, to plant huge amounts of trees. And all you're doing is feeding deer. 
Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you fence you, those trees off. Right. You can't. You can't fence that acreage of, right. of woodland. Of course. Not in not in southern England. It's too many people. Yeah. So, and tree shelters will only work to a certain degree. Um, and you want all the forests to be just pink plastic tubes. You know, you, right. a lot of their government's tree planting plans are based on regeneration. So you know what I mean? So they've got a, so what I do is critical really from a government level. <laughs> yeah. So they want to kind of rewild the landscape, but yeah. is there, there's sort of a lack of understanding about the impact the deer are having, or is this pretty well understood at the, well, at I'm, that I'm driving level? that. I'm driving oh, okay. that government level to be honest i'm speaking to government ministers and really getting involved uh and actually it's fascinating um you know the public are, are very polarized against sporting hunting in britain and the, the weirdness is they don't mind us they don't mind what i do because i'm doing it for management if you did it because just because you have fun and enjoy it they wouldn't enjoy they wouldn't like it's it. your intentions huh yes it is it is so so my i very much go about this under the premise that we're a bunch of committed people. We get satisfaction from doing a good job of managing deer. That is our reward. Yeah. And our aim is to both for the deer's sake and their welfare's sake to keep their numbers under control and sell the meat to everyone we can. So oh, that's fascinating. And you mentioned before that you said that bird hunting, which is an incredibly popular sport yeah. there, has a bad public image right now. Is it because of that? Is it the idea that people are at the bird's expense or sporting? I th it, it's a little difficult because, um, you know, we shoot quite a lot of birds. It's very important for the environment. It's very important way of life in Britain. It's a huge employer in the, in the countryside, full-time professional gamekeepers. You know, unfortunately, um, there's, there's a slight sort of, I think it's a slight, it's class war to a degree. People perceive it wrongly as a very rich man's yeah. thing. Uh, actually, vast majority of bird hunting in Britain is honest working people who get together to do it. You know, yeah. The last time we spoke, I had asked mm. you about that because there's a perception here in the states that mm. there's there is a classist hunting system there because of the private land ownership. And well, there and is I a think, bit. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I bet historically, probably more than today. Yeah, yeah. But you did say that a lot of the folks who are involved in the actual trigger pulling side of things tend to be more blue collar type people. Or you said there's a lot of those folks. It's incredibly even cross section of society. Okay. On my land, the way I work is I have a couple of full time deer managers who oversee everything, who we pay a salary to. But then we have a group of volunteer. They pay us a little bit for the rights to hunt the deer. Okay. And that allows us to have the carcasses at very little cost. And that's how the yeah. business works. But they get the pleasure of harvesting the deer in return for a small fee to us. But those guys come from every walk of life, from every social level, you know, and they just are united. And there's no, that none of them feel better than anyone. Everyone's, you know, they all meet up in the little room, have teas and coffees covered in mud, and they're all the <laughs> yeah. same level, you know. Yeah, and, right. Hunting is a great leveler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Very yeah, easily deer, understood. The, the deer doesn't, don't care how rich you are. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So one question I have for you, uh, you've got your show Farming the Wild. I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy that underlies the title, which mm. you've kind of been hinting at throughout everything you've said here today. Mm -hmm. But more so, I'm curious how and why you're doing it, because it sounds like you have a lot going on between the restaurants and mm. the processing and all of that. So what's motivated you to also make a TV show, which which I know is, is a quite a bit of a, a, a time intensive project? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're now making four TV shows oh, for our no channel. <laughs> of course you are. So we've got Wild Game Masterclasses, which is on right now. Okay. And done really well, thank goodness. And I've also made Fishing the Wild. Oh, wow. Which okay. comes to your screens in about a month and a half, uh, which is the same format, but it's exploring sustainable use of marine and aquatic life. You know, it's spear fishing, it's, 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 it's rod fishing, it's coastal foraging, it's oh, wow. exploring the coasts and rivers of our islands. And, you know, it's, it's a lovely show. And, and then after that, I've done Wild Fish Masterclass. So we've got, oh, wow. we've got and, uh, yeah, and we're, we're right now, you know, and I think we're doing all that again next season. So congratulations. Yeah. Busy. Wow. Uh, but, you know, why do I call it Farming the Wild? It's literally what we do. Um, it, it's literally what we do on a commercial level. You know, I, yeah. I am a wild farmer. That is what I do. My, I, I 
I actually like just like a farmer with his livestock on 500 acres. I try to rotate the the animals. I move them around. I I try to make sure that my stock is healthy. That uh, the the deer are uh, un, you know uh, unworried and and as calm as they can be and have as best life they can have with as little stress. But to make sure that the farmer, the landowner, the environmentalist, the gamekeeper, and me are all happy with what's happening. Yeah. And, <clears throat> so that's what we do. Yeah, it's interesting the history there because you were talking about the 1500s, you know, how fallow deer came to be there. And when we look, you know, in the States back that far, it's such a very different world. You know, this world that's populated by Native Americans, but is is still in the Stone Age at, at a literal sense and not this massive, huge scale, you know, intensive human farming operation, but much more of attending to the wild type thing. Whereas in England, I guess. I guess where I'm going with this is you've hunted in the States. Um, when I watch your show, I'm going like, wow, it's a whole different culture and a whole different world. And a really fun and funny to me is like a whole different fashion sense of what hunting looks like from yeah. the exterior, you know, it is. and it then is. you come over here and the, I, I'm curious because you guys are so famous at taking the piss out of everything. I, I'm curious just how <laughs> you guys perceive, um, you know, but behind the scenes, how do you guys perceive American hunting? Because it must well, seem I, a little bit silly and funny sometimes. Well, no, you know what? It really, I've spent a lot of time in the States and I've hunted with quite a few people. And I love, there's, there's, there's an enormous amount of that in the States that I would rather was done here. Yeah. I, I love the, I think the public land is an amazing thing. I, I really, really love and admire that, you know, and I wish we had more of it here. I wish I could get more people access to hunting, deer hunting in the mm -hmm. UK. Um because it's tough to do, right? You have to really want to do it. <laughs> yeah. But the good news is when you do want to do it, when you get access, what you can hunt is unlimited. Okay. One of my syndicate members last year shot 110 deer. Oh, my goodness. I'm just going to let the Jack Russell out. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Annoying animal. Go on. Get out. You know what they say about a Jack Russell? They're always the wrong side of a door. <laughs> so, so yeah, we we um 110 you know, deer by the way in a year you said because that's mm. that could be uh, that could be a prolific U.S. hunter's hunting career. Yeah, I used to shoot 550 to 600 a year. I can't even really get my head around it. And when I watched you, but you know, I brought this up to you last time we spoke. Mm. I watched you field dress a deer in mm. a with a level of deafness and efficiency that I'd never seen. I mean, never, mm. literally never seen and doing techniques that I, I hadn't seen before either. And so, I, you know, it puts in perspective why you had such a practice hand with it, because out here, people don't typically get that level of, of experience. Look, I used to sometimes do a dozen in a day, you know, and, um, and uh, if I was helping to cull one of the deer parks, you know, these enclosed old fashioned parks where, there's an enclosed herd of deer. Well, you tend to do those culls in over the course of only four or five days in a year. So, you know, if you've got to cull 200 deer, you'll do 50 a day. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I've done a lot of that and, and dress, you become pretty quick at field dressing. <laughs> so, you know, I reckon we used to get it down to about 70 seconds a deer head off, legs off, guts done, chest split, no. hung up in the fridge. Yeah. 70 seconds. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you describe your process? Because um, watching it, I thought, oh, I'd really like to pick up on some of this. I mean, what I saw was like, you get a knife out, you stand on the deer in a way, and then all of a sudden yeah. it's done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, look, the ideal is to have two people, I'll be honest, but okay. one's fine. It, it, assuming I've got someone with me on a biggish deer, the process starts, the first and most important thing for quality of carcasses is bleeding. The faster you can get the blood out of a deer after it's dead, you, you really want to do it for, this is for premium venison mm -hmm. while there's blood pressure in the system. Yeah. And we've experimented with this with thousands, tens of thousands of deer. And we know this for a fact. It's not something we were told by someone else. This is what we found, you know. Right. And blood is the most important thing. Um, the darkness of the final meat is generally down to how fast you bleed it. And wow. if you bleed a deer, a, a, a fallow deer really well, very quickly after death, it will have this beautiful pale pink colored meat. Uh, because blood rots faster than anything else. If you allow the blood to congeal in the in the muscle muscle fibers, uh, then you know you will have blood spots in the meat. It will be dark, and it will have more of an irony flavor than if the blood came out. Okay, and of course, I, when people get you know, if you go to the you go get a T-bone steak from a cow, that animal's been hung and bled, 
And so sometimes people say like, oh, well, I find gay meat, you know, gay me. And it's like, well, it's treated so differently, typically. So, so we don't treat it differently. We kill a deer. We run. We run effectively straight up to it. Bleed it. First okay. thing. And usually, where's that cut? So it's not a cut. It's a stick, just like in an abattoir. So if you take the notch here, mm -hmm. uh, I put the, the blade of the knife. And I you're pointing the to knife. your intraclavicle space there, the space Precisely. between your clavicles. Yeah. So. You put the knife. Uh, what I do is I lay the deer on its side. If if there's any slope on the ground, I'll put the deer head downhill. First okay. thing, let All pressure right? run. Let, it. let gravity help. Yeah. If not, I'll find a log or something or a backpack and I'll pull the back end of the deer up onto that log. OK, right? so it's butts up on something higher. Get, get the get the slope. And then yep. so what I'll do is I'll then go around the back of the deer. So I'm looking at the back of its neck lying on its side. OK, okay. I will then lift up the front leg, <laughs> the upper front leg, reach around, put the deer, the, the knife straight down that line there, push it five, six inches in until I get right in. And then I wiggle like crazy and that will cut the aorta. Okay. okay. At that point, I then- Not the carotid the, artery. You're, you're the, the, getting the, the aorta, aorta as it exits the heart there, ready you to want bring the heart, blood out. You want the heart while yeah. there's still pressure to pump the blood out of the system. Got it. Reverse, unzip the side. This is the important thing. Okay. Not straight up the center to the chin, up the side so you're not rupturing the trachea and the esophagus, okay? Okay, and the then, bacteria and stuff in there. And then cut the whole, cut it out up here and flop it out to one side. And then any green stuff goes out into the grass, not into uh, your carcass. Okay, so you're dropping it from up high you're dropping yeah. the trachea because all that's bacteria in there, right? right? You don't want to get all that contamination. And so that's hanging out. It's green and bitter and bile. So, yeah. so, right. That's the first step. You, you're good then. You know, you bought yourself 20 minutes, half an hour. Okay. As yeah. long as you haven't done a shot that's ruptured its guts or liver or anything like that, yeah. you've bought yourself some time. The worst that can happen at this point is it will blow up a bit. Yeah. Um, but the blood's out and, and the blood's key. You can work that front leg as well. And that's like CPR, basically, right? Yeah, so you're giving it a, an artificial heartbeat. Out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and I let it bleed with blood pressure if possible. Now, look, you might have shot a deer and it might have run off half a mile. And then you might have, um, and, and you might have taken an hour to find it. Say la vie, but it's still bleed it as quick as you can, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, so this is all rifle hunting I'm talking about. We don't do any bow hunting in the UK. We're not allowed. So um, it's considered inhumane there or something like that. Know, it's just public opinion, I'm afraid. You know, yeah. if, I wish we'd been able to bring it in 50 years ago and then it would have been enshrined. But right. I'm afraid it, it is the way it is. So. Yeah. Um, so and we're so populated. There are so uh, houses and people everywhere here. You know, it, it's a whole level of difficulty for hunting. I can tell you. Yeah, it would be so efficient to be able to use a bow in some of those circumstances. Well, like that. If you, it would, but we can't. So, yeah, gotcha. um, so uh, once you've done that, you then walk around. You've seen what you described earlier. You walk around, lay the deer on its back, and I stand on both back legs facing up it. I think let's say so it's a belly male, to the sky. I, yeah, I then that anchors the deer. It anchors it. Can't mm -hmm. move, right? So then you grab its willy if it's a boy, or her bits if it's a girl, and you cut down the tube of the willy. And then you, then when once you've done that and cut around, you then turn to the side. And then if there's someone with me, they hold the back legs up and over, and I then tunnel around the uh, the sphincter. Okay, at the back yep. end, just yep. really simple. Working my way down the cock until you've gone around its sphincter, okay. and then, or, or for a female, the same. That's freeing up its bottom. So, what you've done now is you've freed up the neck, the top and end, the and the bad end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At that ends. point, standing on the legs again, you unzip it, the finger under the knife to the sternum, okay. and run a guide cut up the sternum. Take your chest saw, saw the sternum, okay, open it wide open. And then, uh, this has a hugely important effect. It allows the animal to cool down fast yeah. internally. Really You've opened the whole thing up. It's really if you can now look again, people say, well, I can't do that if I'm in the middle of nowhere. You can't. So what you do then is you just take out the red, the green offal. OK, bleed it at the front end, take out the green offal, extract it and finish it off at the larder. You but, say with a green offal, you mean the intestines, basically the stomach, everything, intestines, everything south, south of the, of the diaphragm. diaphragm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got it. yeah. So, OK. Uh, and that's the Scottish way of doing it because they're having to drag these hairy things off mountains and yeah. through heather and streams and stuff. But I can generally get a vehicle or an ATV close to where I've killed a deer. So yeah. I like to do it straight away. Generally, at that point, what I'll do is I'll then put a stick 
behind the Achilles tendon and I'll hang it from a tree. Okay. And so it's stretched. And the great thing about not lying an animal on its side is on one side, what will happen is the heat will retain mm -hmm. because it's yeah. insulated by its own fur. And the other side, so you'll get two different types of meat. The underside of its oh, left for two wow. hours to cool. The other side, so hang it up, find a tree, hang it up, mm -hmm. put a bag around it, and then if you're going to dress it out in the hillside, right? Because you can't carry that thing all the way back. If you have the luxury of a bit of time, then hang hang the and it's not a moose or an elk because you can't hang it from a tree. Right, it's too right. Big, right? I get that, but I'm talking about white tail and and fallow deer, really. Mm -hmm. You know. This is how we do it. That's all I can describe. Hang it from a tree. Well, we don't have any bears. We don't have any <laughs> lynxes. Yeah, we don't have any yeah. Okay. So we then leave it, and then we'll come back to it when we finished hunting, and it'll have cooled down naturally, okay. and then it goes in the chiller. So, okay. So then your forest area starts looking like <laughs> it's got ornamented because you got fifty deer <laughs> hanging. The well, same no. What I do time. is what I do if I hang it, I hang it well away from any footpaths, and then yeah. I cover it with foliage. So oh no, no kidding! Yeah. yeah. When you said uh, you 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 cut up through the sternum with the saw, so now it, there it is on its side at that point. No, it's on its back. I've on its back. The, okay, I've gone right. To the other end. Do you are are you cutting the diaphragm and then rolling everything out at once, basically, or what happens? Yeah, no, so once I've once I've split the sternum, I then get either my friend. Hopefully, I'm with somebody. They then grab the back legs via the handles I've made in the Achilles tendon. Right. Quick the thing up to waist height. I just reach up, put two fingers in his chuffer pull the whole thing out. Wow. You've seen it on the program. Yeah. And then diaphragm, diaphragm, poof, it's done. The whole thing's wow. happening. It's, it's, it's 60 seconds. It's easy. Yeah, it's, really, it's something I really want to learn. It's like, it's, so, it's really efficient. So I've just done something that will allow you to do that. And hopefully your listeners, which you may be interested in. I got asked recently to do a, um, to make an educational tool for people on this sort of subject. Oh, okay. Okay. So, We've created here in this country, there's a, there's a new app coming, a bit like masterclasses, uh, whereby you can sign up and for the price of two or three boxes of bullets, I've done 12 hours of everything from stalking, field craft, wind, clothing, equipment, rifle skills, shooting off sticks, gralicking, gutting, bleeding, skinning, butchery and cooking, the whole thing. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. And that's going to be available in about mid-February. So I'll, oh, great. I'll, I'll fire you a... I'd love to put it through you to send it to you guys. I'll, I'll fire you a, uh, a code and then have a look and see what you think. I'd love that. I'd love to put that out to our people. Cause I think that there's a big leap forward in what you're doing yeah. that we could take on over here. And, and right now, um, I'm sure you're aware, uh, working with outdoor channel, it's like the food component is the big push that's building mm -hmm. public trust for hunters mm -hmm. right now. And we're having, we're having mm -hmm. like a bit of a Renaissance right now. The food piece is key. And, um, we're all trying to figure out how to get a better quality venison. Out well, of our, and that's out literally of what, what I spend my entire life doing. Nothing else. Yeah, is it's figuring out how to make venison better. I mean, if you ever came over here, we'd love to host you, and you know, you would see. I would take you around our brand new four thousand square foot processing unit. You know, eighty deer a week being being hung, stretched, stand. We have a, it's a process. You know, it's yeah. It's just a process. And, I would love to do that. I'd love and, that. Uh, but it all starts in the woods. You know, it all starts on the fields okay. with passionate people harvesting wild meat. And and that's why I called it Farming the Wild, because honest to God, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like it's it's a really appropriate and thoughtful title, really. Um, to, is there more to it? Uh, like once you've got this process done and you've bled it out, is there anything, any other tips that you think American hunters would benefit from hearing about um, once, you know, either field well, care or once we're in the kitchen? The ideal thing is, let me tell you, it's all about temperature. Okay, honestly, mm -hmm. now this whole thing comes down to temperature control for quality and consistency. So, <clears throat> bleeding, gralicking, gutting. First of all, well, starts with shot placement. Gra right? so, gralicking, you guys call it? Gralicking, yeah. Okay, that's gutting. It's a Scottish word. Okay. It's the word that Scots used to use. It described the sword cut that disemboweled an Englishman, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. So gr gralicking a deer is what we refer to it as. And, um, and so, and the gralic is the guts. Okay. okay. And it's become a universal term. And um, the key components are one shot placement. All right. So kill the deer fast. And then What's your optimal shot? Cause you know, here it's a lot of double lung, but you, you, you're taking a high neck shot if you can. And if it's very close in the woods. Um, yeah. Really right to the forehead. 
yeah, a lot. <laughs> if you can, yeah. Yep. In thick woodland at 40 yards. I mean, off, and we we don't do any unsupported shooting whatsoever. Everything is done off sticks. Yep. To give you an idea, and I, I keep, we keep incredibly tight data. We have serious data on everything we harvest, wow. weights, times, temperatures, where it was done, who did it. In three years, we have lost, as in shot and not recovered, one deer. And Out of all time, of these deer. In, in that time, we've shot, three and a half thousand how important know? are the dogs that you have with you to those recoveries well I've, I've i've really lost the skill of finding deer without them if I'm okay all right <laughs> um yeah they're brilliant and they uh so they stalk with me and they have done it since they were eight weeks old and you know they're they're mongrels really um a lot of people ask about them a lot of people write in and you know the 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 fat one is um is a labrador collie cross and I then crossed her with a old English deer hound, like a traditional medieval hairy thing okay. and a Scottish deer hound rather. And, um, and so I got this sort of, I call her a spectacled lurcher because we call any dog that's a, a greyhound cross, like a long dog, as we call it, okay. a sight hound. We call them lurchers. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and lurchers are traditionally bred for hunting hares and rabbits. All right. And deer. <laughs> but she's different because she doesn't chase. I've got rid of the chase instinct. So Sorrel will. Because they sit right still next to you oh, yeah. while you're looking at deer. With, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. talking inside 40 yards and you're oh, taking yards, a shot. Yeah. Okay. And they're yeah. right there with you, calm and wait for you. I mean, it's amazing. They won't move an ear. They will it's not amazing. move an ear. And, and, and even when the shot goes off and there's deer running everywhere, they'll sit tight. And then, because uh, I might often get another one or another one. So. Mm -hmm. At that point, they'll sit tight. And what, what Millie, the old one, will do is she'll mark the deer. She'll go, okay, that one's over there and that one's over there. And if I leave them, you know, I'll say, go on. She'll go to the first one, find it in the thick bracken and undergrowth. And, you know, and then as soon as she's found it, she'll be like, cool. And then she'll go off and find the next <laughs> one. And you can just shoot. Oh, sorry. You, yeah. you, don't, you don't need to license. The, like here in Maine, uh, to retrieve game with a dog, you need a license for that. And usually you got to hire somebody who has that license. But... Do you have to license those dogs? There's that? really no regulation about anything in okay. Britain. <laughs> yeah, and you guys can shoot your rifle suppressed as well without all the rigmarole we do here. I don't know anybody that doesn't use a suppressor. Man, because it makes... I also shoot supported whenever I can. I like a tripod. And then mm. having that suppressed rifle just makes the shot so much... You know, with all that limited recoil, right? It's like a oh. cleaner shot, hearing and safe. The big ones for me are this. With a suppressor... And if you don't use an overly large caliber, we like quite small calibers. I use a 6.5 Creedmoor for everything. Okay. And for the small deer, I use a 223. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, Munjak and Chinese water deer, it's brilliant. You know? <laughs> so um, the suppressor has several effects. One, I don't go deaf. Two, my dogs don't go deaf. Three, the, recoil, the lack of recoil means I can see the bullet hit the target. Yeah. And I can read the reaction. So I can watch in, if the deer is standing in grass this long, and all I can see is his neck and head. And I've, it's looking at me. Usually I'll go Oi! like this and the deer will look at me like that, you know, and it'll reach up a little bit and then I'll put the bullet in its Adam's apple. And then, you know, you, you'll see a leg go up in the air or something. And uh -huh. through your scope, and, you're saying. Yes. But if you're using an unmoderated 270, you, you won't see it because right. it'll be up here. Sure. So I would, and, and what the, the, the change happened in Britain, thanks really to, the, 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 there's only one breed of real professional government employed deer managers and they're the forestry deer managers and in government forestry and they were issued rifles back in the day usually a 270 and of course they've all gone deaf right they've all, they've all gone what deaf. <laughs> what <laughs> yeah huh? what are you talking about they were all shooting you know 10 deer a day in scotland with 270s yeah. and like uh -huh. so when suppressors came in they were like well they you have to use a suppressor, is the government would say. So they can't really tell their own employees to use suppressors and then not let us. Right. But okay. now when we apply for a rifle, at the same time as we apply, so if I want to change rifles, I can't go to a store with my license and buy one. I have to write to the police for a variation. And I write to the police and say, dear Mr. Policeman, I'd like a variation. I'd like a new 243. And I'd like it issued with a sound moderator. Okay. And the police will send, if they agree, you argue a bit and then they agree. And then they send you a, your license and it says you have permission to acquire a 243 bolt action rifle 
with sound moderator and you can't buy a moderator unless you've got that on your license all right here you know i gotta buy it and then i gotta wait six to nine months for the federal government to give me permission and and it's so silly because um here we you know the um, almost unlimited range of weapons we can possess Mm -hmm. and the unlimited you know and it's it it's so strange that that's the thing they're like oh no if if americans had those then we'd have some trouble (laughs) they've seen too many movies is the problem yeah where where a sound moderator a suppressor goes you know yeah actually it's maybe out of my 22 it's like that you know and it it, it's it's quieter but it's still not quiet it's nice another thing they do that we didn't mention was it's nice uh dawn and dusk when you shoot and you don't have that quite as much muzzle flash and it keeps your vision intact too i really like that it also doesn't offend the locals. Yeah, um, right. You know, we, we're busy. I mean, we're busy. A bit like, say, New Hampshire is busy. We're busy. You know, yeah. lots of people, lots of houses. Yeah. So, but we have a few nice things because it's all private. We don't have to wear orange. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 uh, we are very, you know, I tend to be try and be very low key. So I tend to wear neutral green. I, I wear camo when, when I really need it. Like if I'm sitting in a high stand and I know mm-hmm. there's deer around, I'll put, camo on but generally i wear plain green and and a, a tweed hat like that you know? i love i just got it i just loved you wearing that, that hat i was seeing you on that <laughs> show i was like i feel like i'm watching the shire and lord of the rings here not a hunting show you know it's, yeah. it's so that's one of those differences because here every guy wants to go out looking like rambo you know and yeah, we, we have we, this we actively don't want to look like that right yeah it's like <laughs> this really interesting cultural difference you know yeah. that i think is fascinating and um and of course, the truth is, you know, you can perfectly adequately, your granddad hunted deer in a red check shirt and a pair of jeans. Right. right? Yeah, it works great. <laughs> and, and yeah, it works great. So, but look, I don't know camo. Camo works really well. Yeah, camo has its place. incredible uses. And, and I just don't see it as a fashion statement, that's all. You know, yeah. I, I, I like camo for when it's needed. And it, it has, seriously has its uses in Scotland on open hillsides. And there are different patterns that work really well. And I embrace that, you know, I love it. But generally when I'm hunting in lowland Britain around lots of people, I want to be perceived as very unthreatening. Which is the so, kind of camouflage unto itself, isn't it? That's kind of the so, essence of yeah, it because you're blending yes. in with the populace, you know? So, so I'll wear technical, you know, I use the follow gear a lot. It's brilliant. It's light. It's really, really good. Um, and their plain green stuff is the best I've come across. Did you say uh, furlough? Forlo, F-O-R-L-O-H, yeah. yeah. Made in the US, I believe. Yeah, it? entirely. It's really good stuff. And yeah. uh, I work with those guys since the beginning, and I, I really like it. And um, and their plain green is the best stuff that we've come across. It's lightweight. Yeah. It's not rustly. It's soft, so it's right. doesn't make noise. Right. Because we're often getting pretty up close and personal. Yeah. It. But you on the sure other hand, do. We've also got these big open fields and sometimes I have to shoot them at 350 yards. You yeah. Know? Um, I had asked you before, I, I, we, we got a little off track of it, but um, if there was any other after field care, if there was anything, you were saying oh, it was all about temperature. Oh yeah. Um, temperature. I want to ma- get back to that track. So temperature is the most critical thing. Temperature control and the effect it has on meat is the most effective thing. So our whole driver, once a deer is dead, is to get it into the chill. Yeah. Now, the problem you have with hanging it in say a barn is that even if you do it in winter it might be minus two degrees celsius during the night but it might go up to 12 degrees celsius during the day Mm -hmm. so what you're doing is putting that meat through a cycle of warming up and cooling down right okay that encourages bacterial growth Mm -hmm. um what is ideal and i know everyone has no one but my attitude is particularly on white tails and moderate sized deer and even on the larger deer cut into chunks, saddles, shoulders, you know, hindquarters. If you can hang that deer, even in muslin cloths and let the meat relax for a reasonable period of time, it's going to help it. Not to change the flavor, but to relax the fiber, allow everything to relax. Makes it cook and better. So, yes, it does. So what we like is to have chillers. So on all the land, we'll buy, if, if, we, if we need a holding chiller on a piece of land, so that we're not always driving back and forth. We will invest, you know, a couple of thousand bucks in a secondhand restaurant walk-in chiller. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, they're so cheap. They really are. They're like for nothing. And you get one of those and you just put a metal bar across it and some hooks. And then that thing will run immaculately all the time at low cost 
for like a 10 foot square one yeah. will run at low cost. Even if you only shoot two deer a year, it's worth doing because you'll find a use for that at other times a year. You know? Yeah. Have, Have you found it? What's your ideal? Te- yeah, exactly. What's your ideal temperature that you would want to stay consistent at? One degree centigrade. Oh, wow. Wow. Really? So just above freezing. No kidding. Yeah. Set the meat, let it relax. And at the maximum, we want to keep it out is four degrees centigrade. Okay. One to four. Wow. Over four, you get bacterial growth. Okay. And, um, and the other thing we, we, so what we do is we, we, we're willing to wash deer carcasses out, particularly if they're full of blood or dirty or contaminated. But generally what we do is we wipe them out so that keep we don't them get them too. I'm not really, this isn't, this is a big, I think, fallacy. People say you mustn't wash a carcass. It's not actually right. You, 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 you know, if you, if you go to an abattoir, they will gut a, a cow and then they'll wash it out. Okay. Yeah. You, so the, the, the facts of it are, if you have shot a deer and you've ruptured the gut or you've shot a deer and you've ruptured the liver, or it's been hanging around along and it inside is very bloody, get a bottle, get a bucket of iced water and flush it out. Okay. you know, because it will help bring the temperature down and then wipe it with clean paper inside. Okay. Dry and it out. Good. Once it's in the, then in the chill, it will be a beautiful, dry, gorgeous carcass. And, okay. uh, and then I recommend, and this is another thing I've had people comment on the show say, Oh, you know, you're, you're so wrong. And, and I respect everyone's opinion. <laughs> I love opinion. when, I love when I get a comment that starts with that. Oh, you're so yeah, wrong. <laughs> because and saying, Oh, you know, I've always been taught that you should skin a deer straight away. Well, I do not agree with that. I, I like deer to hang in the fur for five to seven days at okay. one degree centigrade. People say it's not hygienic, but the deer's lived in that skin for four <laughs> years. I yeah. don't see how it can be unhygienic. Yeah. Um, as long as the, the interface between where you've cut it and the meat is clean, uh-huh. you've got no problems. So, mm-hmm. um, so we hang the deer in their fur in the chill. We'll wash down the fur of the deer to get any excess dirt out of it. All right. Yeah. And then we'll hang the deer in the chill for five to seven days and then we'll skin it. And what happens is the fat then has a chance to set hard between the skin and the meat. And the benefit being? You get a beautiful carcass marbled with external fat. Okay. Because a lot of times we're tearing the fat off with the skin when we well, skin Well, you will right because away. you're skinning it hot. Yeah. So you can't keep the fat's not set. Right? Okay. So the carcasses that we are we're producing are amazing. I'm going to see if I can get a picture and hold it up to the screen for you, uh, so you can see the carcasses are insane, and uh, they really are. So, um, yeah, da. And I took a picture in our um, chiller the other day, and they they are ridiculous. So if you can see this, can you see that? Oh wow. No kidding. Yeah. So what you're showing me there, I mean, I could, you know, I'm looking at a little iPhone screen, but it almost could be hogs hanging with that nice thick layer of fat on them. So that fat, though, tends to be so tallowy and waxy. Do you guys have a use for it culinarily? Not overly, but but it presents well. And what it it does, we then, after we've skinned them, hang them for three days out of the fur to let everything dry up. So you go five to seven days in the fur and then three days without all at that same Eight to nine days total process. Eight to ten days. And then, um, but that fat layer will protect the meat from drying out and you won't get yeah. that dark meat, you know? Yeah. That dark rind. That you have to remove usually, off. yeah. And waste, the waste meat. Sure. So by hanging them in the fur, you're not wasting any an ounce of meat. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And you, you feel you get a good uh, flavor development out of that five to seven days? Is that part of it? Amazing. Or is it well, yeah. we're selling these deer to two and three Michelin star restaurants. Right, <laughs> yeah. And if they didn't get the right flavor, they'd tell us. <laughs> yeah. And so then after that part, is that the end of um, the care component of it? Uh, is well, it- no, not at all. Uh, then there's uh, butchery because uh, a proportion of our carcasses go to my restaurant's whole. Another proportion goes to other restaurants whole. Another proportion goes in large parts like saddles and haunches. Yep. And then the rest of it gets broken down by our two full-time master butchers into immaculate, beautiful, vac-packed French trimmed racks, parve steaks, um, double chops, single chops, ground, prime dice, secondary dice, um, 
whole half shoulders, whole shoulders, trim shanks. You know, it, it, we don't, wow. you know, we don't do back straps and ground. We do yeah. everything. So, and then uh, we sell them in boxes to the public all over the country. Wow. Oh, I got to see it. I got to see it. And then thoughts on um, cooking, you know, since you guys have the restaurants, um, mm. it, you know, at this point, you've got a product that's on par with what commercial laboratories are doing. Totally. But um, is, is it then do you still treat it differently? I mean, obviously, it's very lean, things like that. You know, any any thoughts on that? We tend to cook venison very gently. Um, the, the best technique I can give you for cooking a beautiful, I'll, I'll probably classic cut, which I prefer by the way, to backstraps. Uh, we okay. never cook backstraps off the bone. We always cook them on the bone. So okay. we always cook them as chops or as racks. Always. Yeah. Yeah. I like things on the bone, yeah. but, um, like a tomahawk, you know? Yeah. Um, but the best cut is the pave, which is the primal muscles off the, the ham, right? The yeah. haunch. Mm -hmm. trim beautifully and then cut into fat chunks of about eight ounces and those what we tend to do this will seem weird right but we have an oven in the restaurant set on 100 celsius to 230 degrees fahrenheit okay we'll put the piece of meat seasoned with a little knob of butter on it in that oven from raw at that temperature 230 degrees and we'll do that for 11 minutes and then it'll come out and at that point, then it will go into a pan with but foaming butter, rosemary and crushed garlic mm. and salt and black pepper and be smashed in the pan. Right. Huh. And then and then it will be rested only for a minute in the pan until it's golden. Instant reverse sear. Boom. And then it will rest. And then we we'll carve it across the grain and it will be absolutely consistently the same shade of pink from edge to edge. with Zero red in the middle and gray on the outside. Oh, my goodness. Good technique. <laughs> oh my goodness yeah i gotta come out there i i, I want to see all of this you know and i, and I would yeah. i'd love to like kind of walk alongside and, and learn some of these techniques yeah, we'd love it's, to show you yeah yeah it's fantastic well tell us about what we can expect in your upcoming uh show season and um and you know any kind of adventures that you might have coming up on the horizon well, I, as well so i um so we're, we're we're halfway through filming season four of farming the wild which will come out this this september okay of which I filmed four or five episodes in the U.S., which is really good fun. What? Where'd you go? I went to Florida. Do you work uh, with Mike down there, Mike Kimmel? Yes, I did. Yep. Yeah, Called I just got back from. I gone down twice with him now, and uh, what How a was character! It? Uh, it was good the first time. Well, I don't want to say too much because we got our episode about oh, to yeah, launch, but uh, but you know, He's amazing. I, the idea of working with a dog to uh, find snakes is pretty amazing. Amazing, Otto. Uh, Moose is who I work Moose with. Was the other Otto's one. the other one, yeah. Otto's the swimming iguana dog, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so he's an awesome guy and a delight and a wonderful, lovely gentleman and and doing a really great job on invasive yeah, species down there. He really is. Um, he really is raising awareness. I think huge respect for him. Um, we also went with a, a great mate of mine, some really awesome guys, and I found out the guy called the the guys called the Townsends, and I found out all about alligators, mm. about you know, how the problem alligators are moved on, how they're used. We went to an alligator processing plant, which was just like my dear plant, you know, the way they did oh, it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cooked it, went frog gigging. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Nice. That was awesome. Uh, went hunting hogs in the swamps. Yeah. And then before that, I was in Texas and I, with a great friend of mine called Jay Lion Decker, who's an amazing guy, and we have known for years, and we were down near Laredo, right down in the hot stuff. And we were, Hunting again, hogs, white tails, uh, and then uh, nil guy. Oh yeah, how how do you yeah. like that nil guy meat? I haven't had oh, it. Before. God, it was amazing. Oh. Is it? Yeah, it's oh, a yeah. giant, giant blue antelope. Huh? Well, I know. I, I as always with farming the wild, I ended up shooting a female. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the better. We, we eating, never, man. we never really do anything with male deer. Or, or I, I was going to ask you before. Do you, you know, out here it's like everybody's got the antlers all over the walls. Like it's like a big, you know, pissing contest. Yeah. Are you guys collecting? You, you were talking about taking headshots. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm always trying not to. No, we, don't, skulls. We, don't, we, we don't do anything for antlers. I mean, my personal goal on all the pieces of land is to have wonderful genetics and beautiful animals yeah. and big antlers yeah. but we do we don't do any sporting hunting we don't sell any hunts yeah uh, i like to look at them and then when they're past their prime i'll shoot them yeah it's interesting because it, it, it's a more matured hunting culture just being the age of the country and how long people have been at it there it's like it's interesting where priorities kind of shift over time yeah you know? i mean that's also my ethos personally yeah. and i'm mm -hmm. in the lucky position to be able to enforce that on my land right you know, right, right right i i 
I don't want to encourage a culture of looking for big antlers. Yeah. I want to, I want them to be there and they have to look, I'm nothing against it. They have to be harvested, but I don't want to harvest. Them. So we don't, here's another thing that probably you find really weird. We don't shoot any male deer in the rut at all. <laughs> okay. I mean, that makes sense actually to me, you know, they're dreadful to eat compared yeah. to other rut. Yeah. It's so gross. we try and do our male harvest before the rut. Yeah. So any old bucks that need to go, We'll try and harvest Get them early. They start rutting, right? Uh, I've always wondered about that because, man, do they stink? And you know, well, it just they get they get too lean. They. Yeah, they I mean, get... I get it why people do it. I get the primal urge to take an animal with big antlers. I really understand that. It is a primal human urge. Yeah. However, we are, 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 you know, our driver is population control and meat. Right. So, but we're still trying to create wonderful antlers. I mean. I could, in September, you come to my ground in September, we've got a 4,000 acre woodland yeah. and you'll see fallow bucks that will blow your mind. I bet. I bet. Every year. So, but um, I, so I got you off track. You were saying, the, you're talking about the nil guy. And I think you had one mm. other trip you were going to mention. You said, oh, yeah, you went to I, Texas. before that, I went with my friends at Loopold and uh, with Shane Meisel, who's the marketing manager at Loopold. And we went to shoot a, a black tailed deer in Oregon. Oh, and that cool. Was, yeah, it was wonderful. So you got d- different different corners of the country yeah. there. Yeah. And while I was there, I cooked some jackrabbit, which they thought I was a right weirdo. So, so what'd was, you think of that? Because everybody uh, poo poos it. It was amazing. Yeah. And I got the I got the professional hunting guide admitted it was amazing. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I I I triggered it, brined it, slow cooked it, pulled it, made it into a chili, and we had it in tacos. And it was fantastic. It was, it was next level. I just don't. Be, I, I just have not found it to be true that you know people talk about trash species out here all the They're time. On me. They're yeah, on me. I haven't really found it. I mean, some things require some specific technique, but yes, just about every living thing becomes pretty nice when you do it right. Well, dude, so. it does. Even a squirrel, and that's tough. Oh, yeah. I, really? You don't like squirrels? That's my favorite. <laughs> Seriously, Britain probably has the best squirrel hunting in the world because nobody shoots them and they're a huge what? problem. Oh my um, gosh, I'm coming. We're, we're, we're going to do an episode on them this year. I, um, yeah, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I did I did one this year. I've been trying to make this episode for three years mm. because I like to process acorns to flour with my wife and, and make food right. out of acorns. Well, I wanted to do an episode. I like to cook squirrels in acorn, you know? I like to, oh, to, right. yeah, yeah. to dredge them in acorn flour. So trying to get a year where you've got good acorns and good squirrel numbers, it doesn't happen because it's like the acorn numbers drop that causes oh, really? the squirrel numbers to drop. Oh, no, and we, then when the squirrel that. numbers drop, then you get a big crop of acorns. Well, the once there's a big crop of acorns, the squirrels come back up, but then the acorns yeah. drop. And so it's either you do a bad squirrel year and good acorns or bad acorn. Year why don't you squirrels. collect? Why don't you collect a load of a- acorns when they're good and dry store them until the next? That's season? what we do. That's what we do. And we <laughs> and that's what we had to do. But it's just interesting. It's hard to do yeah. the two of the same year. Well, but- I, listen, w- Squirrels here are just a joke. There are billions, really, of them. huh? And, and they all they, they all came from you guys as well. Yeah, you're you're welcome. Uh, it's you, the American gray squirrel, and they've that's they've what you squir- have. Yeah, yeah, you're, you don't yours. think they taste good, huh? Well, nobody eats them. They're Man. tree rats. They're vermin over here. Ah, oh, break I, them I, down I, into five parts, braise them yeah, for yeah, about yeah, forty-five yeah. minutes, and then they are the tenderest, most delicious thing. Well, we're we're going to do um, loads with them in the show this year because cool. I'm with you. But here they're considered absolute out and out vermin yeah. <laughs> um, i love them yeah I, me too and and you know what they you should, they only eat the best stuff right i mean they, yeah, they, that's it they're, they're not they, they, they might be basically tree rats but they only eat the good stuff so. yeah you know here one of the issues with our deer is they're getting into gmo cornfields they're mm. getting into lots of monsanto roundup ready they're getting all these kind of you know they get they bioaccumulate toxins squirrels it's like they eat so clean i love that about them the nice thing about Britain and my part of Britain, the Cotswolds here, is we have very little of that. Like, there's very little GMO crops. There's very little. Wow. It's traditional agriculture. So the deer are very, 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 very um, healthy. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're, right. they're amazing. Yeah, I mean, you can see by the condition of those ones I showed you. Oh, uh, beautiful. They're, they're spectacular. Well, I'm going to you're now the model that I'm going to be using for <laughs> how to how to, you know, seriously, for how to break down deer. I'm going to kind of stop watching what. Well, folks here are doing I'll, kind of skip I'll over send you. you i'll send you um this uh, app that we've created please I and, love and that. i've actually called it farming the wild feed your family with a deer oh and, yeah uh, cool and uh i'll send it to you and it's it's just my thoughts and musings on how to do everything so, i would love that yeah and, and yeah. anything you got you know that's ready we'll share with our with our people over here um yeah, that- let's do that part of the thing where you tell people where they uh where they can find all your stuff um oh yeah and i was just last thing i was going to tell you the shows that we've got coming up oh please uh, yeah so 
Farming the Wild Season 4 in September. But before that, the big news and probably a bit of an adventure is that Wild Game Masterclasses is on its last two episodes now of this series. Uh, that's recommissioned for next year as well. Great. And it's such an awesome show. It's it's in my restaurant kitchen in Chef's Whites, taking a whole one recipe from start to finish all the way through. Oh, being cool. Being chefy, being cool. Mon- this Monday, on uh, next Monday on, on Outdoor Channel, 7 o'clock. Okay. And it's a great show. We love it. And um, I'm doing Fishing the Wild. So Fishing the Wild is my journey around the British Isles. And that starts sometime in April. That's saltwater, freshwater, both? All of it. Lakes, yeah. rivers, um, cool. spearfishing, coastal foraging, me looking like a beached whale, you know, the whole <laughs> lot. and um, and uh, and then we're going and it's really good, lovely food, really good fun. And then the next one we're going to do is wild fish masterclass. So same yeah. thing in the restaurant kitchen. And actually, I'm filming the last five episodes of that next week. So wow, I'm you must be busy, food. man. Mm. I am. Um, and another restaurant coming this spring in England. Uh, all based on uh, my first ever fully carbon neutral, fully sustainable wow. zero waste restaurant project in the middle of the countryside. It's got so a name yet? Fun. It's an old pub. I can't tell you. I can't actually talk about it okay. um, because we're in the middle of, but it's, it's going to be, we might well be making a pretty big television series for British television about it as well. Good, good. So, um, you know, life's pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah. What's your advice to people for uh, managing all, you know, like, how are you managing all of this? You must have a great team. Yeah, work with, it's only two of us. It's only me and Joe, my producer. And then we have Jeez. three freelance editors okay. and uh, we just go, you take that series, you take that series, you take yeah. that series. And we work on timelines and we know, Joe and I have filmed together for 20 years. So we're efficient. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we, uh-huh. we, 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 we know a storyline in advance of what we're trying to achieve. Right. And we, we know what we need to achieve to do it. We do that. And we don't do any more than that. Yeah. And, you know, and we try to craft nice stories. You know, we try to tell a story in farming the wild and it's, it's fun. I, I, it's a re- I adore doing it and I'm enormously grateful to outdoor channel for letting us do it. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty amazing, huh? Like they, I uh, love them. I love. I them. just they're can't amazing. believe how easy they've been to work with. It's, it's yeah, they're wonderful to work with. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and look, congratulations on you guys too. You know, Thank it's you. great. It's great. You know, when I, f- the first season of this was four years, three and a half years ago now with farming the wild and, and it, it, you know, it was a new type of show back then. And it's, 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 it's so good that, you know, outdoor people like Scott Laysath has been doing, yep. he's been pushing this on outdoor channel for ages. These guys really started this whole ball rolling. And now, you know, it's great to see outdoor embracing the food culture around wild food. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm just really hoping to see that demographic grow because the yep. the shows they're bringing in are definitely appealing to a new market, yeah. you know, and, and they really are. And, and, and I think it's totally awesome that, um, that it's happening and I, I'll keep doing it as long as they want me to, you know? Yeah. It sounds like they want you to for a while. Well, uh, all right. So how do people get a hold of all this incredible content and uh, these other products that you're talking about and all well, of this, like where do people so go? Farming the wild and it's other and fishing the wild, wild game and wild fish masterclasses are out uh, basically on most Mondays this year on outdoor channel. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> as far as I can see around seven o'clock. I'm not sure if it's Eastern or central time. Mm-hmm. Um, then uh, soon I'll have the Fieldcraft app out that will that people can then buy into and 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 have on their smartphones and take with them and and really follow all the tips and hints to make you a better hunter. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's coming out. Um, if you come over, anyone watching comes to England, please come to my restaurants. I'd love to see you. Yeah. Send me an email through farmingthewild.com yeah. and um, you know we've got four restaurants, soon to be five. <laughs> always venison on the menu and um what else uh, you know that's about it really um you know i appreciate everyone who watches and you guys for letting me come and do this and uh you know if you guys if you wild fed guys ever want to come to britain and hunt with us we'd love to have you yeah oh we we're you're gonna regret that because we're taking you up on it no, uh, do, <laughs> honestly, do. 
too. Yeah, too. we will. Hey, man, thanks so much. I'm glad we finally got, you know, for people Me listening, too, this is the third great. time we've tried to do it. No, no. Had some, <laughs> some issues getting across the continent like this. But um, yeah, it's been great to talk to you, man. Thanks so much. And you. Thank you so much. And uh, if anyone wants to follow our journey, it's I, my Instagram is Game Meet Mike. And uh, otherwise, it's Farming the Wild. Fitting titles. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.